Hi guys, welcome to part two of the uh, transistor tutorial. Um, in the first part, I hope you watched it, um, we looked at transistors and particularly bipolar transistors and we're going to continue looking at the bipolar transistors in, in this uh, next uh, instalment. Yeah? Um, we discussed the analogy using water pipes of what a transistor actually does. Uh, we identified the terminals, base collector emitter, and the different types of transistors, PMP and MPN. And then we had a look to see what some through-hole uh, transistors look like physically. And we had a look to see how a transistor is specified, you know, um, what what ratings uh, specify a transistor, you know, various voltages like the maximum collector voltage, the maximum current to the collector, the gain, the wattage, and so on, yeah? So... And uh, now we know what a transistor basically does, um, I think it's a good time to have a look to see how they're used in, in real circuits, yeah? Um, so, we'll keep this because we'll probably want this in a little bit. Um, but the first thing we want to consider with a transistor, yeah? Is the fact it has three modes of operation, yeah? Three modes of operation. I told you we'd refer to this. So, the little water pipe, the one that's controlling the flow through the big one, yeah? When this valve is closed, the transistor basically is cut off. This uh, disc in here is fully inserted, yeah? It blocks the flow and no water can flow, yeah? And that'll happen until you put sufficient voltage on the base to start to open the flap which is around 0 0.6 volts okay so when there's less than 0 0.6 volts on the base or think about it if the base is negative compared to the emitter yeah the transistor can't conduct yeah so we could have a negative pressure like a vacuum if you like yeah and still the transistor will be cut off so in that mode effectively the transistor is cut off yeah it can't conduct, it can't do anything. The next mode occurs once we put about 0.6 volts on here, yeah? And the flap starts to open. 0.6 volts positive in respect to the emitter, yeah? So there's now 0.6 volts positive on here, and this valve starts to open the little flap. Some current flows down into the emitter, and it causes this uh, disc to pull outwards, and some current flows this way, yeah? And that will continue to increase as this flap comes more and more open to the point at which it's fully open and no more current can flow down into the emitter from the base and this is fully open and no more current can flow, yeah? At that point, the transistor is saturated. So now, the flap is fully open, there might be 0 0.7 volts on here, for example, yeah? And this is fully uh, out uh, and it's on its full flow yeah and that's called saturated uh, in the 70s we used to call this hard on as well transistor is hard on which is uh, seems to be these days it's called saturated i never really heard that in the 70s but it, it means the same thing so if you do come across that they're the same yeah in between these two these two modes that's mode one and that's mode three yeah there's a middle ground. This is where the voltage on the base is between about 0 0.6 volts when this starts to open and about 0 0.7 volts when this is fully open, yeah? That 0 0.1 volts of a difference, that's the middle mode. At this point, the flap is kind of half open, half shut, or three quarters open, or a quarter open, or so on, but it can be at any position between closed and open, yeah? And this is called the active region. Okay? And that's the three modes of operation. When a transistor is being used in the active region, effectively it's an amplifier. Okay? Well, let me show you. We have a transistor, yeah? We're using MPN transistor because they're the easiest to understand in your head, but the same is true with a PMP, just the voltages, polarities are reversed, yeah? 
So we have we have a transistor. MPN transistor. Arrow pointing outwards in the direction of conventional current, yeah? Base, emitter, collector. We'll, co we'll, we'll collect the emitter down to ground, 0 volts, yeah? Put a resistor in here, a load, yeah? And this is your supply. Let's use 12 volts positive, okay? Now, we can connect from the 12 volts positive another resistor to the base and from the base another resistor to 0 volts okay and we can select these resistors so that the voltage at this point because this is a voltage divider the voltage at this point is enough to turn that transistor halfway on so effectively the flap is at about 45 degrees yeah it's half on half off so some some currents flowing through here yeah the transistor is half on, half off. So let's say the voltage here, depending on the value of, of this resistor to some extent as well, but let's say the voltage on the here is about half for 12. Yeah, it's about 6 volts. Okay? Now, we can put a capacitor here. The capacitor is to block DC. We don't want to change the DC voltage on the base. This voltage on the base, by the way, is called the bias. Yeah? And in this case, because this is positive with respect to here this is forward bias so the transistor is forward biased yeah now let's say between ground and here we put an AC signal yeah and the AC signal peak to peak is about 0 0.1 volts okay what happens now when the voltage is on the positive half cycle of the wave yeah so that the wave forms on the positive half cycle through the capacitor it will increase the voltage at the base yeah so the transistor will turn more on more current will flow this way the flap will open a bit more on the valve yeah so this transistor starts to conduct more from the collected remitter the big pipe yeah there's now more flowing effectively the resistance of this transistor from the collector to the emitter is reduced yeah the resistance from there to there is reduced so the voltage here remember this resistor the load yeah and this transistor are forming a voltage divider again yeah so when you got more forward bias more flow that way more flow this way this voltage will drop yeah so what we see is here let's say these volts we see the voltage drop yeah when we reach the peak of the waveform, the transistor is just on fully open, yeah? That flap is just on fully open, yeah? Just at the bottom of the waveform, yeah? At this point, this transistor is almost a short circuit to ground, yeah? So the voltage here will be approximately zero volts. It won't be exactly because the voltage drop across a fully saturated transistor is about... 0.05 to 0.2 volts yeah so it won't be quite zero but it'll be close yeah i don't know why i put zero volts here this is six volts this is halfway yeah right the transistor waveform in the, the input waveform to the transistor now goes to the seg the negative half yeah so this starts to turn off the flap is moving between halfway and towards fully closed yeah so what happens here now the current down here reduces the current down here reduces yeah and the voltage on the collector rises okay and again we can design this so the peak of this voltage is just enough to almost turn this transistor off yeah when this transistor is off the voltage on here will be 12 volts And then obviously as the voltage decreases comes back to zero we go to the next hot next cycle and the same thing happens again yeah so this waveform was about 0 0.1 volts high yeah this waveform is nearly 12 volts not quite it can't be quite zero because the voltage drop here but the same waveform is faithfully reproduced because we made the peak to peak less than when this valve is fully closed and fully open yeah 
So it reproduces the waveform. But look what it also did. It inverted it. It's upside down. Yeah, That is an inverted amplifier. Okay. The transistor is amplifying the voltage because the voltage here of the waveform is bigger than that. Yeah. So it amplifies the voltage. Yeah. And it also amplifies the current because the current flowing into the base is much less than the current flowing from the collector to emitter. Yeah. So it amplifies the current. Okay. And that is a, a simple transistor amplifier, an inverting amplifier. Now, the other uh, thing we talked about transistors, they can be cut off and sat or saturated, yeah? So we can have circuits that work where the transistor is either cut off or it's saturated, yeah? It's never in between. Well, I say never, it has to be in between at some point because it can't suddenly go from one to another, but that can be like, you know, picoseconds, yeah, uh, between the two. In this case, it's acting, so using that one and that one, in this case, it's acting as a switch. Okay? So here you have a transistor again. Let's do it. 12 volts. Resistor. Transistor. Volts, volts. The base on, yeah? Collector. Emitter. Base. There's our transistor. We, we lost the arrow on the emitter, so I'll put it back in again, yeah? So there's our transistor. Now, this can be done one of two ways. What we can do is, we can put a resistor in here, yeah, up to the 12 volts. And we can select the value of that resistor to give a desired amount of current, base to emitter, so that the transistor is saturated, yeah? This transistor is turned on. Flowing down from the collector emitter now is the big current, the big fat pipe, yeah? The valve is fully open. The transistor is saturated. So here, the voltage on the collector, this is the output, yeah, out. What's going to be on there, yeah? Well, the transistor is fully on. It's almost like a short circuit. So here, on the collector, we'll see about 0 0.05 to 0 0.2 volts, depending on the, you know, the model of the transistor, yeah? Somewhere in that region. We can now connect to here a signal, a voltage, yeah? So if we put onto here 0 volts, for example, yeah, so we have a circuitry that when it wants to turn something on, it sends out 0 volts, yeah? When we put 0 volts on here, let's make it simple, let's do a, a switch, yeah? When we close that switch, the base voltage goes to 0 volts, yeah? This transistor is now cut off. There's no more flow. What current was coming through this resistor is now going straight through the switch, yeah? No more flow. So this transistor is off. So the voltage here on the output will now be 12 volts. Yeah? Because this is effectively not there. So we just have a resistor connecting to the output. And the resistor, the voltage there would be 12 volts. Depending on what the load is. Yeah? That's assuming that the value of this resistor is low compared to the resistance of the load. Yeah? If it's not, the voltage here will now be the voltage divided between the resistor and the load, yeah? But when we open that switch and this turns on, this will go back to almost zero, regardless of the resistance of the load. Yeah? So, that's acting as a switch. Now, think what's happening here. This resistance can be very high, yeah? So, this resistance could be like 100,000 uh, ohms, or, or 10,000, let's put 10k in, 10,000, yeah? We need to get at least enough current for this to turn it on. Put 10k in there. This resistance here, here can be very low, like 10 ohms. 10 or 10 ohms. Whichever way you like to do it, yeah? So, the current flowing through the switch, when you close the switch, is very small. It's 12 divided by um, the resistance. I equals V over R. 
So it's 12 divided by 10,000. Um, it's not a lot, is it? 12 divided by 10 is 1.2, divided by 100 is 0.12 by 1,000. Uh, 0.012, 0.0012 amps. It's like 1.2 milliamps, yeah? Very small. The current flowing through here, depending on this load, is, is high. Yeah, much higher. 12, assuming that's a kind of a short effect when this transistor's on, current flowing through here is, is 12 divided by 10, 1.2 amps. Okay? So, this switch can be very, very small, a tiny little switch. Yeah? Or some circuit that effectively does the same, depending on temperature or light shining on it or something else, yeah? And this can be low and it can power up you know, a big device. This this could power, for example, a relay. Yeah, you could put a relay in here with with, with switch contacts. Yeah, so when, when it turns on, it clo it, it activates the relay. That's being used as a switch. Of course, we can do it the opposite way around. It's still a switch. We can do it like this. Your load resistance, your output voltage, collector emitter. Try not to lose the arrow this time. And we can connect from here the resistance to ground, yeah? And we can connect from here our control circuit, which here says we'll just make the switch. We'll make the switch again, yeah? Ah. Now, in this case, when the switch is open, this resistor holds the base at the same voltage as the emitter, basically, yeah? So we we put the resistor in there. It could be you know quite a you know a decent value, one kilo ohm for example, something like that. Yeah, hundred ohms, a kilo ohm, something whatever you want. That's a circuit designer's job, not mine. Yeah. Um, so in this case, when the switch is open, this transistor is turned off. There's no base current. Yeah. So the voltage here, if this is plus twelve volts, the voltage on the output is about twelve volts. Through that resistor, there's no current flowing. It's the same voltage on both ends. No current coming flow, yeah? When we close the switch, we now <laughs> we now blow the transistor up. Because when we close the switch, what happens is we put the full current through the base and three meter. This base can only go to about 0 0.6 volts. We've just put 12 volts on it, and we've blown the transistor up. So we now smack ourselves on the wrist, but we weren't circuit designers, and we go and put a resistor in the circuit here, okay? Now, when we close the switch, then we can I don't know, give it whatever we want, 10k or something. No, that should give it about a volt there. Yeah. So now, when we close the switch, we turn this transistor on. We don't blow it up anymore. The transistor turns on now, yeah? And the voltage on the output drops to 0 0.05 to 0 0.2 volts, somewhere in that region. The opposite way, yeah? So, effectively, this switch is activated by 0 volts signal. And this is activated by higher voltage, yeah? In this case, I mean, the resistor would specify the voltage, yeah? We could put the resistor in here, and we could say, have a signal coming in of, say, 5 volts, or 3.3 .3 volts. And put the resistor there, yeah? So that's a transistor being used as an amplifier and being used as a switch and being blown up because I didn't design the circuit very well. <laughs> okay? Right, so... Those are the modes of operation of a transistor. Now then, how many legs has a transistor got? Three. In all these circuits, the emitter is common to both the input and the output circuit. So, in your amplifier, your signal on here is varying the voltage on the base a little bit and varying the current flowing to the emitter, yeah? So there's current coming from the input circuit into the emitter. On the output side, the current flowing through the collector also goes through the emitter. Yeah. So the emitter passes that current plus that current. I drew this on the last lesson, but okay again. If the current flowing down here is 100 milliamps, yeah, into the collector, and the current flowing into the base there is 5 milliamps, the current flowing through the emitter will be 100 plus 5 is 105. Okay. And the same applies. 
with these. So the emitter terminal leg pin is common to both the input and the output. And this configuration is called common emitter. Huh? And that is the most common <laughs> the most common way to use a transistor. This is like the normal way that the transistor is used. However, we can use the transistor in other ways. Uh, so now uh, we're going to have a look at the next way we can do that. So it makes some sense that the next way we can use the transistor is either with the collector, which is the common to input and output, or the base. Yeah, uh, and the next most common after the com after the common emitter, which is like the normal the normal way to use a transistor, we have common collector. Okay, with the common collector, we have an input into the collector, yeah, an output from the emitter, yeah, and the base also via resistor connects to the collector. And we'll put another resistor here because we need to a voltage divider, yeah, to make the transistor work. And this will go to naught volts, ground naught volts, yeah. Now, if we put in here, of course, 12 volts. What voltage will we get on the base? Yeah, what do you think? What voltage will we get on the base? And I'm hopefully going to say. Well, Rich, that depends on the value of these two resistors because it's a voltage divider. Yeah, you're dead right. So, if, for example, this was like uh, one kilo ohm, yeah, and this was one kilo ohm, the voltage on the base is going to be half of that, yeah. Two resistors in series effectively is a voltage divider. So the voltage here is around half. Is, is well, you'd say it's half of that, six volts, yeah. We've got six volts on the base, yeah. What voltage do you think is on the emitter? What what voltage do you think is on that emitter? Uh, well, I'll tell you what. What did I say was the voltage difference between the base and the emitter? What must it always be for a transistor that's turned on? Yeah? It must be 0.7 volts for a saturated transistor, yeah? Assuming there's enough current flowing down here to saturate the transistor which as long as you choose these resistor values right there will be yeah between there and there will be 0 0.7 volts right what volts is on the emitter 6 minus 0 0.7 5.3 volts so coming in we've got 12 volts and going out we've got 5.3 volts we've now got a voltage regulator yeah of sorts, it divides the input voltage by half minus 0 0.7. Okay, but if the input voltage increased to say 24 volts, yeah, this voltage here would increase to 12 volts, yeah, and this would go to 12 minus 0 0.7, 11.3 volts. So it's not a very good voltage regulator, is it? Really, it just drops voltage, yeah, it just drops voltage. The current flowing this way is small. The current flowing through the base is small. The current flowing that way, I do that bad, didn't I? The current flowing that way, depending on the value of the load, the resistance of the load, yeah, can be big. Yeah. So, this circuit, basically, is amplifying the current. Yeah, because the collector is common to both the input circuit, collector base, yeah, and collector emitter. This is your common terminal, yeah? So the current flowing in the input circuit is basically what's flowing through this resistor divider, plus the little bits going through the the, the, the um, base, yeah? Base, collector emitter. So the current flowing here 
through the base circuit is small, the current flowing through there is big. So what this is, it's a current amplifier here. Yeah? It amplifies current. More current in the output circuit, collector and emitter, than there is in the input circuit, collector base, yeah? But it's not a voltage amplifier. The voltage here on the emitter can never be more than the input voltage, yeah? So that, it is, voltage amplifier, it ain't, and it can't be. Okay. No. This circuit is often called a voltage follower. Yeah? Or an em emitter follower. So the emitter for the voltage out follows the voltage on the base, minus the the forward bias of the of, of the base to emitter. This is very similar to a circuit you'll see a lot in real life, yeah. And this circuit is called a series regulator, series regulator. Okay, and it's based on this with one difference. Let's draw it. Voltage in, collector, emitter, out, this is your load, load here, yeah. again we'll put the resistor in from here, I'll draw it sideways this time, I'm sure you know it makes no difference, resistor to the base, yeah, but instead of putting the resistor from the base to ground, I'm going to put a Zener diode. I talked about Zener diodes in the diodes tutorial, and if you watch that, or you already know, a Zener diode is reverse biased, and it has a breakdown voltage. And when you pass current through a Zener diode, as long as the voltage across it is higher than the breakdown, then that diode will conduct, and it will hold the voltage at this point at exactly its breakdown voltage. So, let's put in here like uh, a 10 volt. Zener, yeah? 10 volt Zener. Z E N E R. Now, if we put 12 volts in here, yeah, we're going to get here 10 volts. Because the Zener diode will hold that at 10 volts, yeah? Current will flow through the resistor and through the Zener, and some current will also through the base to emitter, yeah? So, I don't need to ask you now the voltage on the emitter, do I? It's 0 0.7 less than that. 9.3 volts, yeah? We've got 9.3 volts. What happens now if we put 24 volts on here? Well, the voltage here will stay the same. You'll get more current flowing through the resistor, you know, double the voltage, double the current. More current flowing through the zener, double the current. But the voltage will stay the same, and the voltage at the output will stay the same. Now we have a series regulator or a voltage regulator, yeah? Okay. What makes what? What's the problem with this circuit? Well, there isn't a problem as such, but there is an issue with efficiency. Yeah. And I'll put explain it to you like this: When this had twelve volts on here, and this had nine point three volts, yeah. The what's the voltage from the collector to the emitter? Well, it's twelve minus the nine point three. Yeah. So it's 12 minus 9 is uh, it's 2.7. So from here to here is 2.7 volts. If you connect your test meter from there to there, you will see 2.7 volts. Yeah. Now let's say this load draws one amp. Yeah, one amp of current, one amp of power. Yeah. What's the wattage? being dissipated by this transistor. Well, watts equals V over, sorry, not over, watts equals V times I, voltage times current, yeah? So 2.7 volts times 1 amp equals 2.7 watts. Okay. What happens if we put 24 volts on here? Well, there's still 9.3 here. So the voltage across the transistor now there's a difference between 24 and 9.3. Well, between 24 and 10 would be 14, and it's 0.7 more than that, so it's now 14.7.
volts between here and here. And we still have the 9.3 across the load, yeah? So this, this will still have 9.3 volts across the load because that stabilizes. What's the wattage of the transistor now? Well, it's 14.7 times 1, 14.7 watts. That's quite a lot of wattage. That's something getting very, very warm. That's a transistor that needs a good size heat sink on it to stop it overheating, yeah? So the problem with this circuit is efficiency. Um, the, the bigger the voltage drop that you require from the input to the output, the more wattage that this will dissipate. And that wattage is just heat. It's just going to heat your room a little bit more. It's, you know, it's not doing anything useful. So this sort of circuit... Um, you used to see it a lot more back in the day. Now there's much more efficient ways of doing that. Um, but you will see it, and you'll see it where the voltage drop required isn't very much, and you want to stabilise the output voltage. Yeah. So the input voltage can be wandering around a bit, but you want that to be stable, and that's where you'll see this. Yeah. The current flow when you go from 12 to 24 through this diode doesn't make much difference because the value of this resistor is quite high so you might only have 20 milliamps flowing this way and if you go from 20 to 40 milliamps it's or from 10 to 20 it's not it's not a big issue in fact you could even actually if when you change this to 24 you could double the value of that resistor then the then the uh, current flowing this way and the base stays the same yeah just by changing that from say a 1k to a 2k okay so that's a common collector circuit and the reason it's common collector is because both the input current through the base and the current to the emitter are common. The collector is common to both of them. And that's what, that's what it's used for. So let's go on to the third one, common base. So this is your common base uh, transistor mode. Okay. Um, so effectively, it's a strange one. By the way, it's a strange one. We have transistor, yeah. supply voltage, out, yeah. output voltage, your base is connected to ground, yeah, and the emitter is your input. Okay. Now, by varying the voltage on the emitter, you will vary the voltage between the base and the emitter. Yeah? In this case, because it's an MPN, if you think about it, the voltage to turn this transistor on has to be about 0.6 volts. Yeah? Because the base is connecting to ground, your input would go between 0 and minus 0 0.6. Yeah? That would be your input signal there. Yeah? And then this is your re collector resistor uh, to just limit the current from collector to emitter so as not to blow up the transistor and this is your output. This is an unusual circuit. The common base, the most important thing I say is it's not very common. Yeah, Common base is not very common. It does have its uses. Um, it gets used especially in radio frequency circuits and high frequency uh, radio frequency circuits, UHF and such like that. Yeah? Um, and the reason it's used for that is because it has a very, very good frequency response over a wide range of frequencies, yeah? Um, the other thing I'll tell you about this circuit is that this is a voltage amplifier, yeah? Because the current flowing, sorry, the voltage difference between the base and the emitter is small compared with the voltage between the collector and the base. So this voltage of a signal can be much bigger, yeah, than the voltage of the input signal. But it's not, it's one of those, but it's not a current amplifier. And this is because the current flowing in the output circuit cannot be more than the current flowing in the input circuit. Um, the third thing I'll tell you about them is you'd probably you'll never see one. You'll probably never see this. Uh, it can be a bit difficult to get your heads around it sometimes. Uh, and you'll probably never ever see it, yeah? Um, 
this business there would be the current amplifier, not a current amplifier. It's, it's because the output current can never be any more than the the collector emitter current. They can't, it can't be any more. In the same way as that series regulator, the output voltage can't be more than the input. In this case, the output current can't be more than the input current. Um, if you're repairing radio frequency stuff, yeah, you might you might want to know that. Uh, so that's really the, the last uh, type of way that transistors are used. I've never seen one of them, I don't think. Not anything I've tried to repair anyway. Um, so let's have a bit of a look at um, a few common types of uh, transistor circuits using more than one transistor. Like we did before with resistors and series in parallel. You can use transistors and series in parallel as well, and for quite interesting reasons. So, uh, let's do the transistors in parallel, yeah? in parallel and you generally do this because you need more output current or you need to dissipate more wattage than one transistor can handle so what you'll basically have here and you'll find this in output stages of amplifiers and that sort of thing yeah something that's driving a fair bit of power uh, and what you'll find is this sort of thing so you'll have base emitter yeah Collector going to the a load, yeah. This is positive supply, if you are, yeah. Positive supply, and you'll find this sort of arrangement where you've got uh, another transistor like this in parallel with the first one, yeah. Right, so yeah, and you might have another one, yeah, and you might have many of them, yeah. So again, transistor, load, emitter, put circles on them. By the way, you'll quite often see transistors without the circle in some schematics. You know, it's just that's just how they've drawn them. That's all. That should go to the middle. Um, the thing with this type of arrangement, and the reason I haven't drawn the emitter to ground, is because when you're using transistors like this, there'll be a slight difference between one transistor and another due to tolerances of tolerances of the manufacturer of manufacturing. There'll be a slight difference at which point the transistor turns on, and at which point it saturates. Yeah. So if we were just con if you were connect all these like this. You might find that when the transistor starts to turn on, this one will turn on before that one and that one, and then this one and this one, and finally that one. So one transistor is on more than the other. Now you think, well, what's, what's the problem with that? The problem is that when only one of them is on, it's doing all the work, it's taking all the load, yeah? It, it, it's, it's dissipating all the wattage. So what you'll find in this type of arrangement... As a small resistor, it might only be like you know an ohm or something. You pretty much assume it's going to be a small value, maybe less than one ohm. And this is so that the voltage at the emitters can be slightly different. And it allows the fact that this one might have like 0 0.61 volts turn on, and this might be like 0 0.63, and that might be 0 0.59. Yeah. So you'll find circuits like ah. Oh, Normally, with this type of circuit as well, these transistors can be matched, yeah? So effectively, the manufacturer has taken whole batches of hundreds of transistors and tested the, the uh, voltage, the, uh, the turn-on voltage, and he's put them into batches, yeah? So that you might have batch A, batch B, batch C, batch D, and so on, yeah? And each batch, a load of transistors happen to have almost the same turn-on voltage. And this can become important when you're repairing things like amplifiers that use this. And you might have like eight of these, yeah? Uh, if you've got some blown transistors, it can, depending on the design, can be very important that you match the transistors, that they're matched. Otherwise, you put it back together and one will be doing more work than the other, one will get hotter than the others, and it'll work, but it won't take long before it blows up again, yeah? So that's how transistors tend to be used in parallel. And the reason to do it, basically, is it increases the maximum current, yeah? 
and the wattage that can be dissipated yeah so you can handle loads with with much lower resistance okay this this load effectively this effectively is your load although i've chosen just to be resistors this effectively is your load so you can you, you could draw this like like this yeah one, one resistor load and then down to all your collectors yeah and you, and you, you, you can draw it like this i won't bother put the base drive in uh have another one yeah and then small resistors so it, it can be drawn like that. that that's more true than this actually so i spotted my little error there okay why do you use transistors in series well this is where it sort of gets a bit interesting and this is where the reason for NPN and PMP transistors becomes more apparent. Now, just going to get this off another bit of paper. One moment. Do you remember this circuit? This simple inverting amplifier that I drew, yeah? What's the maximum peak to peak value of the waveform there? Well, basically, it's 12 volts less, a little bit, you know, the. the, the uh, the voltage dropping across a, a fully turned on transistor so this waveform here can only ever really be around about six volts negative peak and six volts positive peak yeah for that power rail that's what it can be also this isn't very efficient circuit because we biased this forward bias so the valve the flap in the pipe was half open yeah normally and then when this goes positively it opens it more when it goes negative it opens it less but normally, even when, say this is music, yeah? You've got no music playing, nothing coming in, and yet this is still passing current. It's still half switched on and half switched off. Yeah? So this is still dissipating power in the load, yeah? There's still current flowing through the transistor. And you're just effectively wasting power, yeah? So there's got to be a better way, hasn't there? This is where your transistors in series come in. So. You can have an arrangement like this, and I'm going to refer slightly to my notes, but here we go. First of all, we'll talk about the power supply coming in. Transistors in series, yeah? We can have a power supply like this. This is a transformer, yeah? This is your 240 volts. I was just all in your transformer, yeah? And we can have an output like this. Yeah? And the centre tap on the winding, yeah? And we can have a diode here. And we can have a diode here. Yeah? And we can have some capacitors. Yeah, here. And now, let's say this winding is, is a 24 volt winding, yeah? And this centre tap is here, yeah? So between here and here, we have 24 volts, yeah? Now let's connect this middle one to ground. What we've now got here, if we measure from ground to here, we'll see plus 12 volts, yeah? And if we measure from ground to here, we'll see minus 12 volts. So we now have a power supply that's both plus and minus. This can be very useful. This can be very, very useful especially in audio and amplifier circuits but other uses as well okay so let's have a look at using some transistors in series yeah and we'll do it like this plus 12 volts okay and then we'll have here um, an npn transistor yeah base and then here we'll have a pmp transistor yeah And this will go to minus 12 volts, yeah? So the two transistors are in series, yeah? Now, we need some biasing. So, we'll put resistors in. Put a resistor in here. Yeah? 
and we'll put some more resistors in to make a voltage divider yeah and we can now by selecting the value of these resistors bias this transistor so the base is around 0 0.6 volts more than the emitter and we can bias this one so the base being a PMP is the other way around the base is about minus 0 0.6 volts compared with the emitter so across there to there you've now got minus 0 0.6 volts yeah and across here to here you've got plus 0 0.6 volts right so we can do like that now we can connect an input to this signal as well so we'll put a uh, capacitors again to put DC because we don't want to change these voltages yeah and from the capacitors we can connect these to a signal waveform yeah and the other end of the signal not going to minus 12 volts the signal is between this point here and ground okay we can now connect from here a load let's have a speaker let's have a loudspeaker yeah and we can get loudspeaker to ground okay now these are biased so the transistors are just almost switched off it's just just at the point where they switch on yeah so when there's no signal coming here this transistor is off it's almost on but it's off yeah this transistor is almost on but it's off so the current flowing through here is zero yeah no current can flow because both transistors are off yeah it can't flow down to ground this way it can't flow that way nothing can flow okay now let's see what happens here on here on the output this is naught volts yeah this is naught volts in our waveform now when the waveform goes positive yeah so we're playing some music we've got a sine wave yeah the sine wave goes positive what happens is you turn this transistor on because you increase the voltage on the base here yeah that now goes more positive yeah up to like 0 0.7 the voltage increases so the current here increases yeah this transistor starts to turn on this one's still turned off because what's happened here as the voltage on that increased yeah the voltage on this increased as well so it might have gone from 0 0.6 now to minus 0 0.5 it was minus 0 0.6 now 0 0.5 so this transistor is even even more turned off than it was before this one is more turned on than it was before so current flows through this transistor can't go down there because it's switched off but you can go into your speaker to ground yeah and that's the current flow as you increase this waveform here to its maximum peak the voltage here goes to about 0 0.7 or a bit more depending on the transistor and this current flowing down here will reach its maximum yeah and you can design the circuit so that at the peak of this waveform that is just at its maximum what happens now the voltage starts to come down so the current here starts to decrease so your output waveform starts to decrease yeah at the zero point this transistor now turns off it's back down to 0 0.6 and as this goes negative the voltage here drops so it might go down to like 0 0.5 so that's even more turned off than off yeah it can't conduct this one however is now turned on because it was minus 0 0.6 we're on the negative half and this goes towards minus 0 0.7 so this transistor turns on yeah the current through a pmp transistor flows the opposite way in the direction of the arrow so when this one was on the current was flowing this way through the speaker yeah when this one turns on the current flows out of the ground terminal up here through the transistor to the minus 12 volts yeah and as this reaches its peak this current reaches its peak yeah and then this starts to decrease again and this starts to decrease again and so on so we have an amplifier yeah we have an amplifier two things interesting about this amplifier first of all have you noticed this is a non-inverting amplifier because yeah? when this waveform goes positive this goes positive and when this goes negative this goes negative non-inverting the second thing what's the peak to peak voltage now here well it's not six volts anymore it can go up to 12 and down to minus 12 as near as damage yeah so the peak to peak voltage here now is 24 volts 
it's put say twenty. It's plus twelve and it's minus twelve. Yeah, that's the peak to peak plus to minus twelve. So there's like a there's like a, a, a twenty four volt change effectively. But this can go plus twelve or minus twelve. That is basically it's not it's got a name. It's called a class B amplifier. That one, the first one I showed you, by the way, uh, just to confirm that, that first one I showed you is a Class A amplifier. I've lost a bit of paper now. But the first one we had is a Class A amplifier. This is a Class B amplifier. It's much more efficient, and we're using two transistors in series. Yeah? But we can actually go a bit better than that. We can do this. I'll draw it simplified because you don't need to draw all this biasing anymore. We can do this. It's all those bias resistors are there, but I'm not gonna bother to draw them, yeah? So we've now got four transistors, two NPN and two PNP. Again, the bias resistors there, but I'm not going to show them. And there's your inputs. You've now got two inputs, yeah. And the input is with reference to ground, yeah. We're on this supply, yeah. Plus or minus twelve, and there's a ground, yeah. So you input between the junction of these two capacitors and ground yeah now what we can do with this we can arrange so that the waveform coming in here yeah is inverted on this side so this is just the same as that it's just in, being inverted with a transistor yeah you know you can use a, an inverting amplifier on the transistor now what happens where are we going to put the load well we're not going to connect it to ground we're going to connect it between here yeah and here now what happens on the positive half cycle here the MPN transistor turns on and conducts current down into the load yeah it can't go through here because this is turned off yeah when this goes positive, this goes negative. So on the negative half cycle, this one turns on the PMP, yeah? And the current flows back out of the load and through this transistor to ground. So that's our current flow on the positive half cycle, yeah? On the negative half cycle, this PMP transistor turns on. So current now flows through the load that way, yeah? And this one is now positive it's inverted so in this case this one turns on then the current flow is like ah so we've got current flowing on the positive half cycles the current's all flowing like that and on the negative half cycles the current's all flowing the other way yeah this is called a, a bridge or sometimes a full bridge yeah what's the maximum peak to peak wave voltage across this now well when this one's fully conducting it's almost saturated and this one's fully conducting it's almost saturated this end of the speaker is now connected to plus 12 and this end is now connected to minus 12 so the maximum peak is now 24 volts yeah it's double that one the other way around, on the negative half cycle, it's that way, yeah? So this end is now connected to plus 12, and this end is now connected to minus 12. So the maximum voltage across the speaker now is 24, whereas on that one, it was 12. This, by the way, not in amplifiers, but this has other uses. This doesn't have to be a speaker. This could be a motor. So 
effectively when the current flows through one direction the motor turns one way one turns the other yeah this can also be called a half bridge not to confuse you with bridge rectifiers by the way full bridge half bridge so that's uh, a common circuit you need to know about it because you will see it you'll see both full bridge and half bridge circuits uh, so that's transistors in the series uh, there's one other way we can use transistors connected together. Well, say not one. There's many other ways we can use transistors connected together. Uh, we can create s circuits which are oscillators, so th the effectively create, you know, a sine wave. Um, they produce a an oscillating uh, waveform. We can get square wave generators, and we can get triangular wave generators, and we can get sawtooth generators, and we can get sine wave generators, all made with transistors. Uh, there's plenty of places uh, for circuit design we can look these up. I'm not going to go into them now because for the point of view of repair we don't really need to know uh, about those circuits. We're more interested in what's gone wrong. But just be aware that there are things like that, yeah? Um, but there's another way commonly that you can use uh, a couple of transistors together. And this um, it has got a name and it's called a Darlington, yeah? In fact, Darlington or Darlington transistors sometimes you even see them in one package and the Darlington transistor is this I'll draw an NPM on yeah so this is your collector yeah this is your emitter this is naught volts this is plus volts yeah here's your base and then what we do is this here let's put a circle on the transistor the base of this yeah, goes to the emitter of another transistor, like so. Yeah, what are? And this collector goes to here. In. Out. As you can see, with with the transistor parallel, effectively we double or increase by more the current capability. In the bridge and half half bridge and bridge, we double or more the the the, uh, the, the voltage across the load. Yeah. What this does, this actually increases the gain, but it doesn't double it. It, it multiplies it by the gain of each transistor. So. Normally, if you put a signal into this transistor, yeah, and the transistor had a gain of 100, the HFE gain, for 1 milliamp coming in, you get 100 milliamps out, basically, yeah. So the gain of that transistor would be 100. Let's say this is another transistor the same, yeah. So what happens here is, you put a base, you put a signal to the base, say, let's go small. Let's say you go into 1 microamp into the base, yeah. This has a gain of 100. Okay, so coming out of here is now 100 microamps through the collector to there, coming through this resistor, yeah? 100 microamps now goes into this one. Yeah, from there. Because you've already multiplied it by 100. And this multiplies it by 100 again. So effectively, by using two transistors with a gain of 100, HF, HFE, and this one, HFE, 100, 100, you get a gain of 10,000. Which is far more gain than you can get from one transistor. And you don't have to stop there, you can stick another stage on front of this. You can make this so sensitive that even if you touch your finger against two metal pads here, the microscopic amount of current that passes through your finger is enough to turn on here a big relay. Imagine the touch, so you touch it and the door opens, yeah? That's called Darlington. And it's quite a common configuration when you uh, are working with bipolar transistors. Um, so that's really, I think, enough to get you going on uh, transistors and how they're used in circuits. So there is a third and final part uh, to the bipolar transistors, and that's going to be... Uh, what goes wrong with them, uh, how they fail, uh, why they fail, and can we test them, how to test them in circuit, out of circuit, 
if we have an unmarked transistor can we determine which is the base collector and the emitter so i'll see you on the third part for that one hope you enjoyed this one see you soon guys